I got a freaking paper towel. No longer must I deal with the tyranny of using my own jacket as an eraser. Plus, I won't need to hear the zippers clanging up against the whiteboard every single time I need to get rid of something. So, uh, I'd say this day's going pretty well so far. Discussion, yes. Cross products, also yes. So it turns out that I don't need to memorize the cross product formula because finding the cross product using the determinant is actually a lot easier. Say you're given two vectors and you want to find the cross product of them. Make a matrix with the 3D unit vector and the two vectors. Next, start building your vector. You're going to need three mini matrices, and this is how you're going to find them. This is the mini matrix for I. You take I and you ignore everything in the same row and column of it. And what's left over is what you're going to be multiplying I by. Remember when you're doing this that J hat is negative. So we've got all of our mini matrices set up. Let's use the formula for the determinant to find our new cross product vector. There, that is our resultant cross product vector. Looking pretty cool. Oh, paper towels are a godsend. You can also use the cross product to find a vector that is orthogonal to two vectors. If vector C is equal to the cross product of A and B, then vector C is going to be orthogonal to both A and B. Because watch this. A is equal to 3, 2, 1, and B is equal to negative 1, 1, 0. First, let's take the cross product. Alright, so this is what C is equal to. To show that C is orthogonal to both of these vectors, let's take the dot products. We see that the dot product of A and C is equal to 0, therefore A and C are orthogonal. Now we see that the dot product of B and C also equals 0, therefore B and C are also orthogonal. Math. Alright, so today we went over the other classical model of citizenship, the Roman model. Now, unlike Athens, Rome at its height was what one could call a pretty, uh, a pretty thick empire, so direct democracy wasn't going to cut it. For the purpose of administrative efficiency, citizenship was granted first and foremost to local aristocrats. And unlike the Athenian model, foreigners actually could obtain citizenship if they had been living in Rome for 10 or more years. This policy mainly existed for the purpose of keeping foreign capital, money, and resources inside of Rome instead of them leaving with their owners. It is important to note, however, that foreign citizens were limited in the ways that they could contribute and participate politically. Later down the line, citizenship would be granted to all eligible men in Rome. So, we have two models to compare here, the Athenian model and the Roman model. With the Athenian model, we see much, much more exclusivity in the way that citizenship was granted, but we also see many more rights and privileges coming with that citizenship. With Rome, we see citizenship being granted a lot more abundantly, given to a lot more people, but less rights come with it than, say, the Athenian model. So today, our citizenship laws exist in this kind of limbo, where we can obtain citizenship if we're not born with it, but also, due to the size of our country, we don't have as much direct democracy as the Athenians did. Next are emoluments, and they are the first shady thing that I have been introduced to in my ethics class. An emolument is basically a benefit that one receives, financial or otherwise, from holding an office. Which, on the surface, doesn't seem that bad, because a salary is defined as being an emolument. And obviously, since being a public representative or official in the United States is a job, they receive a salary, which, again, is an emolument. But the Founding Fathers were concerned about a few things when it comes to emoluments. First and foremost is a U.S. official or public representative becoming dependent on a foreign nation and not representing the best interests of the United States. This is where the Foreign Emoluments Clause of the Constitution comes into play. Basically, the Foreign Emoluments Clause of the Constitution states that no office holder in the U.S. can accept gifts from kings, princes, or any other foreign state without congressional approval. 
Keep in mind that this was originally intended to make sure that U.S. office holders were to remain independent from any foreign interests. While the Foreign Emoluments Clause is a good thing to study when looking at governmental ethics, it plays a actual real role today. There have been many questions raised whether President Trump has actually violated the Emoluments Clause. So a little bit of background information first. Over the years, presidents that have been involved with businesses normally divulge their interests to what's called a blind trust. Basically, it's a group of people that the president has no involvement in that take care of their business so that the president can act with impartiality when they are in office. Now, Donald Trump said that he was going to do that. Kind of. Basically, then-candidate Trump promised that he would put his funds in a blind trust that was controlled by his children. Now, many critics argued that a blind trust controlled by one's family isn't really blind, especially when the people controlling the blind trust are going to be working for and with you in the White House. So, that's where we were when Donald Trump was inaugurated. So. President Trump's company, which is now run by his sons, Donald Jr. and Eric Trump, has a branch hotel in Washington, D.C. Since President Trump has been inaugurated, officials from countries such as Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Kuwait have reserved rooms and stayed in that Trump hotel. Many people would argue that these countries are choosing to stay in Trump's hotel to specifically gain favor with the president. In addition, it was later reported by the Washington Post that a Saudi lobbyist spent more than $270,000 to reserve rooms in that same Trump hotel for 500 nights in total. Now, this was in order to fly in many veterans in order to lobby against a military spending bill that the Saudis opposed. But the fact still remains that the Saudis spent this money at a Trump establishment within a month of his election. So. We were then asked whether we think President Trump violated the Emoluments Clause or not. And here's my hot take. Let's take the bottom case first. I don't believe that this case right here means President Trump violated the Emoluments Clause, and here's why. The Saudi lobbyists that were staying at these Trump establishments had stated motives that were other than influencing the president. They were sending veterans to Capitol Hill to lobby against a spending bill that they were opposed to. The second reason being, at the time this money was spent, the Saudi lobbyists had no idea whatsoever that Donald Trump was going to win the election. In fact, it was widely regarded opinion at the time that Hillary Clinton was the inevitable victor. So, if the Saudis decided to influence the president by doing this, they were taking a huge risk. There's a third piece of evidence in this case that is really, really, really impossible to overlook. At the time this money was spent, Donald Trump was not a U.S. office holder. The Emoluments Clause just didn't apply to him. Again, at this specific time. So, even if the Saudis had expressed intent to influence then-candidate Trump, which would be dumb of them to say, but even if they had said it, even if they had made it plain to the world that they were spending money at this Trump establishment in order to influence the president should he get into office, the Constitution could do nothing about it because the Emoluments Clause only applies to U.S. office holders. Now, the top case is a little bit more murky because as of this reporting, foreign governments are still giving patronage to Trump businesses. In fact, President Trump frequently hosts official U.S. diplomatic meetings at his estates, the most notable being Mar-a-Lago, where he has hosted foreign leaders like Xi Jinping, the premier of China. So again, this is a very, very, very difficult situation. But here's what I've come up with. While it does seem really, really, really fishy that these foreign governments, who would definitely benefit from having favor with the president, are continuing to give patronage to his business, I do think that it is very legally difficult to justify this as a violation of the Emoluments Clause. There are several middlemen that are in between whoever is buying these rooms and the president. The first being the president's kids. They're the ones running the business. They're the ones who technically get to decide whether to accept this patronage or not. 
although one could easily argue that the president does have the final say over whether to take the money or not. Then, of course, there is the Trump Hotel organization itself and the diplomatic corps of whatever foreign government is renting these rooms. So there are three middlemen involved in a potential transaction that makes it especially difficult to pin down a purpose. All three players could have different motives for this transaction. So, in order for this to be a legally provable emoluments clause violation, a couple requirements would need to be met. The first being that foreign governments were specifically spending their money in order to benefit President Trump. Whether they expected anything in return for this action is inconsequential, because remember, the emoluments clause simply bans a president receiving a gift or emolument from a foreign nation. It doesn't matter if the foreign nation expected anything in return. Secondly, President Trump would have needed to be aware that the foreign government was trying to present him with a gift at all. If he was never told, he would have never gotten an opportunity to refuse, and I think it would be pretty unacceptable to charge him on an emoluments violation when he didn't even have a choice of whether to accept or not. And this perhaps is Trump's best legal defense, because remember, his businesses are technically operated by his kids. Now, can we imagine that his kids brought the matter up with him and that Trump gave the final guess or no? Yes, but a legal prosecution would need to prove that happened. The last requirement is, of course, that Trump would have needed to accept the gift. Without accepting the gift, I mean the emoluments clause just doesn't apply. There is one other situation that I could imagine where the president could be charged with a violation, but I think it is a little bit more difficult to prove. That being that there exists in the White House some unspoken environmental atmosphere that if you give patronage to President Trump's businesses, then you are going to receive official U.S. benefits. Now, the reason that this would be so difficult to prove is you would need an overwhelming amount of witnesses from inside the White House, from the lowest level to the highest level. And I mean a lot of witnesses. Enough witnesses that anything that President Trump says to deny the fact, or any of the things that his closest advisors say to deny the fact, could be proven moot. So this wouldn't really be the best way to go about it either. So in conclusion, while this practice is a little shifty and morally dubious, I don't think it amounts to an official emoluments clause violation. Uh, oh, politics! <sighs> Alright, so I still got some homework to do. <clears throat> got a club meeting to go to. <clears throat> it's gonna be alright. <sighs> That's it for tonight. See y'all on Monday.